Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that up, Dasha. All right, so let's get started. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it is my great pleasure to um, uh, welcome you to this fifth, I believe, um, session of our uh, Sorbonne Literary, Russian Literature Seminar. And um, uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome today our colleague from uh, Arizona State University, uh, Dr. Hilde Ugenboom, who uh, will uh, give a a talk today um, called A New Approach to Russian Literary History. Uh, a few words about Hilda. Hilda got a PhD in 1996 from Colombia, and she works as a social professor of Russian in the School of International Letters and Cultures at ASU. Uh, she was the Jesse Baldupon Fellow at the National Humanities Center and postdoctoral fellow in the Eurasia Program of the Social Sciences Research Council for a forthcoming book, Noble Sentiments and the Rise of Russian Novels, a European Literary History, which is which will come out in 2023 at University of Toronto Press. She was a research associate at the National Humanities Center for a new project, Noble Rot, Corruption, Civil Society and Literary Elites in Russia. She is the co-editor of two collections of essays on Russian women writers and a selection of Nadezhda Flashinskaya archival letters in Russian. She has numerous articles on women and she could translate uh, Catherine the Great's memoirs for Modern Library in 2005. Uh, she was on the board of the Association of Women in Slavic Studies and is past president of the 18th Century Russian Studies Association. So, Ilda, uh, again, we're very glad to have you today and uh, um, thank you very much for accepting our, our invitation, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Could I share my screen, please? Absolutely. Uh, let me just check on that. Right, there you go. You're good. Okay. Okay, that, that should work, right? Okay, um, I'm so glad to be here. J'aime beaucoup le français, et si je lisais cette présentation, je la lirais en français. Mais je préfère vous parler de mes idées, et donc je vais parler en anglais. Et si vous avez uh, du mal à comprendre, uh, uh, je vous prie de me dire. Thank you. <laughs> so I work on women writers, and I've been working on women writers for over 20 years to integrate them into Russian literary history. And I found myself questioning the assumptions and traditions of our field and of literary history more generally. Uh, so not everyone may be aware, but our field has been on Oprah, uh, who put uh, Anna Karenina on her, on her book list. Uh, it's been featured in the New York Times when the new English translation of War and Peace came out. It's uh, a regular feature in the uh, interviews of famous people in the New York Times uh, book review when people talk about, famous people talk about what they've read or wish they had read. And it's part of the New York Review of Books translation series. Uh, and perhaps this picture is different in France, and I would be very interested to hear from you on this. Uh, so my goal has been to discover new works and, and view works we thought we knew with different eyes. Uh, but this is a challenge uh, because the field is very invested in its canon of writers. Uh, according to Gary Saul Morrison, they, these novels probe the ultimate questions of human life. What makes a life meaningful? What is honesty? What responsibility we owe to others? And similar timeless questions. In Anna Karenina, people have accepted the same myth that Anna lives by, the myth of love as transcendent romance rather than everyday intimacy. And we'll return later to the Russian soul and timeless questions in Anna Karenina. Uh, but it turns out that we can quantify the canon, at least in the United States. And I'll be very interested to hear what this picture looks like in France. Uh, so Greta Matzner Gore is a Dostoevsky scholar who graduated, got her PhD at Columbia University, as did I. And I discovered that uh, Columbia University is, is responsible for a good deal of scholarship 
on Dostoevsky, especially since Deborah Martinson uh, was in charge of uh, the uh, international and the National Dostoevsky Society. So this is a real generator for scholarship. Uh, in the field, we call this a, a Tolstoyevsky problem, uh, but in fact, Tolstoyevsky includes even most of what Dostoevsky and Tolstoy wrote. Uh, and so this, these past two years, uh, there's been a marvelous Zoom seminar, a working group of the 19th century Russian culture, uh, and we've discovered that it's not just women who are not part of the canon, but almost everybody else. Uh, and so there's a, a separate uh, Zoom for what is called the other 19V. And so we might be surprised to see how many write writers there in fact were in the 19th century. A, uh, an ongoing publication uh, of uh, bi uh, biographies and bibliographies of 19th century writers uh, has will include about 3,500. Uh, of which there are about 400 women writers. And as you see here, uh, this is a database uh, for the European Union. It's based in the Netherlands and there are over 500 writers. And I oversee that database. It's a research database that anyone can use. At the end of the 19th century, a dictionary of women writers included about 1,900 women who were involved in literature, translations, publishers, including 1,300 women writers. And so that's not so bad compared to the 4,000 women writers in 19th century England. So, I work on Nadezhda Khoshenskaya, who is, I think, Russia's greatest forgotten novelist. And uh, 2022 is the 200th anniversary of her birth. She was the eldest of three writing sisters, Russia's Bronte sisters. Over 50 years, she wrote a dozen novels, two dozen tales, poetry, drama, sketches, essays. In 1870, she was the third highest paid novelist after Tolstoy and Turgenev. In 1861, the Dostoevskys invited her to contribute to their new journal. She had published two novels that year and had published seven novels in the previous decade and an eight volume complete collected works uh, was, in the, was being published. And Kwasinskaya turned Dostoevsky and others down uh, because she was overcommitted. Her uh, full biography shows that she herself did 13, uh, 30 translations from French, German, Italian, and Norwegian, and that she herself in her lifetime had been translated into French, German, Italian, Swedish, Serbo Croatian, and Czech. And so here we see what I found as the last available translation uh, of hers in French in the Literature Russe uh, series at Plan Nourri, uh, and this is from 1916. And so I thought I would give you an overview of the research that I've been doing over the past 20, 30 years uh, and my basic research question, uh, where are the narratives for these data and these women? I asked this question at our Slavic conference in 2015 of the editors of Oxford's new History of Russian Literature. And I was rewarded by one sentence in 900 pages about Nadezhda Khoshinskaya. And this is in some ways a reflection of the scholarship on her. There is very little. In 1997, Irina Safkina sums up the challenge that faces uh, uh, we who work on women writers in her review of 22 books on Russian women's literary history. How to write that history without one, doubling the canon, and two, without creating a mini canon, or three, an anti canon, still remains an open question. And so my goal is to make the canon irrelevant. Uh, and by changing our narratives of literary history, by changing the context entirely when we add women. 
And so my current work uh, builds on three main research areas. I'm, I'm currently at work on, on two articles on gender for two different Oxford handbooks. Uh, and I have, I have done extensive work on compilations of women uh, and on the Khvashinskaya sisters. And as Rodolf mentioned, I've just completed a book. So the work on Russian women writers starts in the 1980s in earnest. Uh, Barbara Helt's Terrible Perfection is still a classic, uh, but she rejects novels by women, saying that the best novels were by men, the best heroines are by men. Uh, and in fact, this uh, made it impossible for women to become great novelists. And so she turns her attention to autobiography. I once asked her at a conference whether she had actually read any novels by women, and she said no, because I think if, if there were any good novels, we would know about them. Uh, Catriona Kelly in 1994 uh, put out two books, one with translations and this history, uh, but she also doesn't think much of 19th century women novelists because, as she put it, uh, they're not as great as George Eliot. Uh, never mind that in the 19th century, everyone compared Kwasinskaya to George Eliot. And in fact, what people thought of George Eliot was rather different than what we think of her today. And so my model for my work is uh, Diana Green's work on Russian poets in the 19th century. And she's been at work for a long time on a book on novelists, but for health reasons, she can't complete that work, which is a real shame. So in my work on biobibliographic compilations, so compilations that include uh, initially just biographies and then bibliographies as women became writers in the, uh, in the 18th century, uh, I was interested in how it is that women became separate, uh, separated with uh, a great deal of uh, scholarship about them, but simply separate from regular literary history. And what I discovered is was an, an international trail, all going back to Boccaccio's on, in, on famous women, which might also have been called on infamous women. And you'll see by the color coding that uh, all these works refer to each other. So the works in red, uh, the, most, uh, the most recent ones refer to the previous ones in red and yellow, et cetera. And what you, what you discover if you've worked in uh, these kinds of references before is what we call today a, a lot of plagiarism. Uh, there's simply a lot of copying. And so around 1700, uh, three volumes come out in uh, Germany and in England, and they all refer to, in various ways, to the works underneath. And they all start with lists of the works that they consulted. This is a very nice network graph of women who compiled biobibliographic compilations of women. And you'll see that they start with Christine de Pizan, uh, who in fact, didn't exist on our scholarly horizons until the middle of the 20th century uh, when uh, scholars in the United States uh, did uh, put her on the map. And here you'll see a number of these compilations from around 1800 in various languages. So this is a, this is a genre uh, that can tell us uh, very interesting information about how it is that women were categorized and what I discovered is that there was what I call an international competition among learned women. So nations would compete by, by their learned women. And being a learned woman is, was something that is, I think, near and dear to our hearts. It meant that you knew languages, especially ancient languages, uh, beginning with the languages that were closest to the Bible, uh, Hebrew and Greek. And uh, so it means that education, uh, debates about women's education are front and center in uh, uh, all kinds of uh, debates about gender and feminism. 
And this made sense to me. Uh, in the 18th century, our, Russia's learned ladies included Catherine the Great and Princess Dashkova. And in the 19th century, uh, Russian heroines, uh, beginning with Pushkin's Tatiana, are are extraordinarily well read compared to European heroines. And this is a tradition that women writers continue, especially Yevgenia Tour and Nadezhda Khvashenskaya, who knew a number of European languages and were extraordinarily well read. So these are then distinguishing features of, of Russian literature, especially when we deal with um, heroines and women writers. So since this is a seminar for graduate students, I thought it would be interesting to know, uh, to follow the trail of where my information comes from, how to do this scholarship. And so the Dictionary of Russian Women Writers is an extraordinary resource because it brings together many things that are available only in archives, in materials that are hard to find, and it's all available in English. I've already mentioned the uh, Russian writers 1800 to 1917, it's seven volumes, uh, and it does something very important for Russian literary history. Uh, it was a project spearheaded by Yuri Lotman. Uh, you may know him as a semiotician, uh, but he also did a lot of semiotic work on Russian noble culture. And of course, noble culture, especially service culture, is one of the features of the Russian nobility, and most writers came from the nobility. And so what this uh, collection does is it puts front and center the service records of writers. Uh, so you have a much better understanding of uh, where they come from and what they're writing about. It includes uh, helpful appendices about the table of ranks, uh, about education, uh, and about employment uh, that all are relevant to uh, one's service. And for those of you who are not familiar with the table of ranks, uh, it was a system put in place by Peter the Great beginning in 1722 to expand his, uh, uh, his administrative uh, capacity for his empire. And it required service, lifetime service of nobles in either the civil service or in the military. And you acquired rank in this way. Uh, the lowest was 14, the highest was one. And your rank was also the rank of your family, your wife and your children. And then when women married, they acquired the rank of their husbands. And finally, Michelle Morisi uh, did groundbreaking work in the archives on a very special but mysterious feature of Russian noble women. Uh, their right to own property. And what she discovered was that by 1800, noble women owned half of all property. And what owning property in Russia actually meant was that you owned serfs. And so serfdom in Russia, uh, as it relates to nobles and to noble writers, is another completely underexamined area in Russian literature. Uh, there were, by eight, 1861 uh, and the emancipation of the serfs, there were 50 million serfs uh, in a population of 70 million people, and that we can compare to the United States, which had only 4 million slaves in a population of 30 million. Uh, so in Russia, that population was over 75% uh, of the entire population. And another fact that people aren't aware of, I think, as much as we should be, is that the emancipation in 1861 didn't, in fact, emancipate the serfs. Uh, they continued to be tied to the land. They were not citizens. They did not have passports. Uh, and they had to pay reparations to their masters. That was to go on to 1910. And that was, period was shortened after the 1905 revolution. And so serfs finally had freedom of movement in 1907. So that whole period of you know, Russian uh, literature that we know and love in the 19th century uh, very much takes place against the background of serfdom. And so what we discover 
uh, when when men go off to service, uh, women have they have the legal right to their property, uh, married, unmarried, and they can legally manage their husband's property. And so it turns out that noble service is a family affair. Uh, the men perform the service, but the women, as as owners of land, as managers of their husband's properties, uh, they were responsible for uh, sending recruits into the army and for uh, collecting taxes. So these are, uh, in the center is a portrait of uh, Nadezhda and her sister Sofia Kwashenskaya, a third sister, Praskovia. Uh, uh, these make up the Russian Bronte sisters. And I'm part of a, a wonderful European project uh, based at Cambridge uh, with Anna Berman. Uh, and we are celebrating the uh, Jubilee next year with a conference. And the purpose is to build, uh, to consolidate research and build up a cohort of scholars at all stages in their careers. Anyone on this, uh, in the audience who is at all interested in the Khvashenskaya sisters or in women writers, um, we invite you to uh, participate uh, as this project goes forward uh, and as we build out the research, uh, research resources. In addition to the conference, there will be two volumes of papers. There will be a website at the Slavic Reference Service at the University of Illinois, which is supported by Title VI funding from the US government. Uh, it is a resource for anyone who turns to them. Uh, and there will be uh, not only uh, all of the archival material that we've collected, which is over 500 letters that we've tra transcribed, uh, but their works uh, scanned uh, plot summaries with keywords uh, because we have to start somewhere as we get uh, research uh, going on women writers. Uh, and there will be a list serve uh, that anyone is uh, uh, free to join. And we're promoting English translations of the sisters' novels. And so one thing we hope to do by promoting these translations is to encourage Russians to publish uh, women writers. And in fact, there is more work available in the United States in English translation than in Russia. And I'm very curious about what this picture looks like in France. And in 2024, there will be a, a conference at Illinois uh, with the Association of Women in Slavic Studies. Uh, Illinois has summer work research workshops, and these are all open to students anywhere. Uh, your lodging is fully funded if you can find airfare. So for my book project, uh, these are uh, three important works that form the foundation for my research and my thinking. Uh, and you'll see immediately that none of them are from our field. And uh, so you'll recognize, I think, Franco Moretti's Atlas of the European Novel. Uh, and that uh, was a huge, uh, a huge influence on me as I gathered data. And in fact, this was the graph that got me thinking. And you'll see that he discovered uh, that Russian literature comprised a mere 20% of the market, that in fact, 80% of that market for novels in Russia through 1850 uh, was literature and translation from Europe. And my own research, going back to the catalogs, uh, discovers that the number is more like 90%. And so when we're talking about Russian novels in the first half of the 19th century, we're talking about a 10% slice of what readers were reading. And those are numbers based on whatever, whatever information I could find. Uh, so uh, the journals are only cataloged, their content is only cataloged through 1825. And so I, I don't have the rest of the information and obviously there's a good deal more in the journals. So Margaret Cohen's work on the sentimental education of the novel is about French women writers 
uh, in the period uh, before and after 1800. And in, her, in, this, in this prize winning book, she articulates a completely new idea of what sentimentalism was, uh, that it was not the expression of emotion, but the restraint of one's passions for the greater good through an acknowledgement of one's duty to others. And I'll talk more about this. And finally, Karen Offen's uh, groundbreaking work, uh, comparative study uh, that includes Russia about feminism going back to 1700. And it is a work that basically goes into the archives and looks at all the publications uh, that have been produced by women as well as men uh, for over two, two, 300 years. And it's an argument against our amnesia as feminist scholars, uh, limiting ourselves to the 20th century. And it's an argument about uh, theorizing uh, a lot of the work, a lot of the terms that we uh, recognize from uh, feminist theory, she puts in quotation marks because in fact, uh, it's not clear what the corpus of materials are because so much still remains to be uncovered. And so what she argues for is a deep knowledge of history. And here, the subtitle of her work is so important. It is a political history. The struggle for feminism is political. Uh, it is not rhetorical. It is not narrative <laughs> and all the other categories that feminist theorists like. And so the argument that women are part of political life uh, is, is one that I like greatly as an expert on Catherine the Great. And it's an argument that I use in my two articles on gender, uh, starting with Richard Steitz's uh, declaration that in the 19th century, in 1860 to be precise, it was Russian men who first and best advocated for women. And I thought this, this just doesn't make any sense. Uh, women are writing very actively. Uh, and so this is a, a myth that our field has created, that men, in fact, were the best advocates for women. And I've discovered already that in Richard Steitz's early work, uh, this was his dissertation that he turned into a book, but in his early work, uh, what becomes very clear is that the ideas that Mikhailov brought back from Paris, uh, he had gotten from Jenny Dericourt. Uh, and so you'll get you get an idea of how I'm going to approach that project. So let's get going with Moretti, uh, because what the data I gathered show uh, is that uh, Europe had a literary empire of translations, and that Russia was a full participant in this empire. And what? The way that we can see this is not by following the first editions of all the writers, the dates that we know and love, Crime and Punishment, 1866, but by looking at reprints and looking at the market more broadly uh, at translations. And so here, uh, color coded again for French and German uh, so that you get an idea of uh, how completely saturated the Russian market was. And this is important uh, because it shows that Russia was not a, a backward country. It was not a backwater in the European literary empire, uh, the thing that Russians were so afraid of in the 19th century. And that, uh, but it does also show, so here we see, for example, Katsuboy, August Katsuboy, the German sentimental uh, playwright and novelist. He lived in Russia, and that does account for part of his popularity, but it was simply widespread. It was as widespread in Russia as it was in England. Um, and in fact, all these works, 60 works alone in 1802, the year Karamzin complained about him, 
And when Pushkin complained about him in 1824, that's the, the second longest line, 40, 40, over 40 works. Katsuboy initially uh, had 20% of the Russian market for publications, uh, an extraordinary number. Uh, my book contains over 30 charts, uh, 11 for European writers in translation, and then nine for Russian writers. Uh, and so what you see in John Lee, for example, she wasn't just the leading woman writer, she was the leading French writer in Europe and not just in Russia, but in England. And so this changed my idea of, of English writing also because not only is John Lee in the top five, but so is La Fontaine. Uh, and uh, we think of England as being a producer nation, uh, but it is also a remarkably international market. Walter Scott is familiar to all of us, but here we see that his reputation kind of peters out after his death and then picks up again at the end of the century as his work is uh, kind of re recalibrated for the growing youth market. And here uh, is Alexander Dumas and his most important work, much translated and much beloved in Russia, The Count of Monte Cristo. And some of you may know about Dostoevsky's complaints about Paul de Kock, uh, who had a resurgence in those very years that Dostoevsky complained about him. And here is D Turgenev's career. And so when we move beyond the six novels that we're familiar with, we see that he wrote in a variety of genres and he followed a very good publication strategy of how to keep his name before his readers uh, by publishing regularly in a variety of genres. So not only were Russians wrong about their market, but Moretti is wrong about it too, because he argues that the peripheral markets in Europe are not like the big market and just a smaller version, but that they are stunted markets that only have the, a very limited selection of what is available in the European literary empire. But this turns out to be a false picture of the Russian literary market, which was exceptional in its breadth and its depth of European literary works. And I found this by looking at the numbers, we, we're familiar with the number that there's only 5% literacy in Russia. But Russia was the largest country in Europe. And so 5% of a large country is a large number. And so 5% of the Russian population could be equal to the 90% literacy rate of Sweden, for example. And then the other thing to keep in mind is that booksellers were not looking at literacy for a whole country. They were looking at statistics that they could easily get their hands on, and that was cities. And so much to my surprise, I learned that in 1850, St. Petersburg was the third largest city in Europe after London and Paris. So together, Moscow and St. Petersburg were an extraordinarily attractive market for foreign booksellers. But keep in mind that Russians did most of their reading in translation. So it turns out that Russia has many readers and they're reading not the elite works that Russian literary histories like to uh, foreground, such as Rousseau and Voltaire and Adam Smith, uh, but they were reading Paul de Kock and Dumas. Uh, and finally, they were reading George Sand. And I thought since this is a, a French audience, uh, this part of my work would be very interesting to you. Uh, and so let me read to you what, what Moretti says about this European literary empire. It is a regular monotonous pattern all of Europe reading the same books with the same enthusiasm and roughly in the same years when not months. 
all of Europe unified by a desire not for realism, the mediocre fortune of Stendhal and Balzac leaves no doubts on this point, not for realism, but for what Peter Brooks has called the melodramatic imagination, a rhetoric of stark contrasts that is present a bit everywhere and is perfected by Dumas and Sue and Verdi, who are the most popular writers of the age. And missing in this list, of course, is George Sand, whom everyone was reading. Uh, and Moretti ignores women writers, we've discovered, um, but he also ignores all the reprints of the old novels and focuses on uh, what is the latest. And I discovered it's not realism, but it's not melodrama either. And what it is, is sentimentalism. But here I think we can also ask with great puzzlement, how is it possible that sentimentalism lasted a hundred years? It was supposed to end at the end of the 18th century. But market data shows that sentimentalism in fact lasted through the 1850s. And this is part of Margaret Cohen's argument. Um, and when we look at one of the classics, uh, the Rise of the Novel by Ian Watt. Uh, he both uses and rejects market data. He argues that readers in England, for example, uh, in a growing middle class, preferred realist novels that showed their life. But he also said the market showed that the majority of 18th century novels were actually written by women. But this has long remained a, a purely quantitative assertion of dominance because sentimental novels by women were a literary degradation that pandered to readers. But sentimentalism in the 18th century and in the 19th century was respected by contemporary tastemakers. When the Vicomte de Vogue writes his Roman Russe and he is making his argument for the superiority of, French, of Russian novelists over French novelists, he uses the standard of George Eliot, his favorite novelist. And he argues that she comes from a long tradition starting with the sentimental writer, Samuel Richardson. And so the 19th century George Eliot is in fact a sentimental writer. And so now we'll see how that is possible, because today she is, of course, considered a great realist writer. And it's because realists, the 20th century, Balzac, Scott, incorporated uh, sentimentalism into their novels. And here, Margaret Cohen gives us, for the first time, a typology of sentimental novels. Uh, and this typology, typology shows that the conventions of these novels all serve to foreground the moral struggle over a war of competing duties. Uh, the plot is light, the descriptions only serve to emphasize the moral struggle. Uh, there is an analysis of the heart, there are tableaus, and all of this is to foreground that inner struggle. And, this is a struggle to do your duties to others. And Cohen argues, importantly, sentimentalism introduced a new duty to oneself, a duty to happiness and to love. And so what I discovered is that what we're looking for in novels to trace sentimentalism is the actual word duty. And it's present everywhere. And when readers encountered the word duty, they understood that they were talking, at, they were, what they were reading was at a higher moral philosophical level. This is where the action was in all of these novels. And so Clarissa in 1742 is defined by her filial duty, but so is Emma in Jane Austen, and so is Edmé Maupas uh, in George Sand's novel. It, it, works, it works in every 19th century novel that I've read. 
with the exception, I'm going to, <laughs> of Tristram Shandy by, uh, by Lord Stern, uh, who is in fact uh, rebelling against uh, sentimental conventions in that novel, even though it's, it's always highlighted as a, as a sentimental novel. So where does this debate start? In the 18th century, Henry Mackenzie, the author of The Man of Feeling, kind of ironically dubbed it the War of Duties. And he was complaining that there are so many duties and there's this new pleasant duty to yourself. But in fact, the origins for the importance of duty date back to the end of the 17th century. We, it's very visible in Madame de Lafayette's La Princesse de Cleves as she uh, thinks about her duty to her husband. And one origin is uh, we find in Leviathan by Hobbes, uh, who in his great concern for human nature, which is fundamentally violent uh, in its passions and greedy, uh, he advocated for a strong government and philosophers and writers and uh, of, all, of all kinds after him began to think about how it would, how we could educate people uh, to be their better selves. And the Locke's treatise on education, for example, uh, foregrounds the cultivation of duties to others. Uh, the movement for sociability at the beginning of the 18th century is a movement to cultivate your relationships with other people in order to temper your passions. And finally, how is it that sentimentalism hung on for all these years? Because it hybridized so easily with historical novels, Gothic novels, realist novels. Uh, it's, it's everywhere in Trollope's novels uh, uh, and uh, everywhere in Russian novels also. And it turns out that sentimentalism is, is not simple at all. So by the end of the 18th century, uh, Kant and Schiller are debating, is there only traditional difficult duty in which you uh, do what you do not want to do? Or can you somehow align your duties with your uh, inclinations? And the key word here is inclination. So sentimentalism also turns out to be a powerful literary aesthetic because it is fundamentally politically ambiguous. Uh, it can be both radical, you can love the wrong person, and it can be conservative. In the end, you agree to marry the person your father wants you to marry. Uh, and we see this pattern over and over in novels. So sentimentalism is not only ambiguous, but it is opportunistic. It allows us to have uh, all, the, all the things that we want but don't fit together well. And so this new view of 18th century sentimentalism is still a big deal today in, in at least three fields that I can think of. So we're all familiar with the history of emotions and William Reddy wrote a foundational text uh, that is widely used uh, on the history of emotions. And he relies heavily on the caricature of sentimentalism as uh, understood uh, in the 18th century. And so he puts the emphasis on the importance of the uh, use of emotions to uh, create a new view of human beings where no matter what your social class, everyone is human because everyone has, has those same feelings and we can all identify with each other uh, no matter our class or our social standing or our wealth, uh, we can identify with everyone together because we all have those feelings. And so this is a democratization through, uh, through emotions. But what in fact, if this is really about duty, uh, about lower classes able to restrain their emotions and to conceive of their duties to others, to 
have self-government and have a right to actual government. And that, in fact, is a much more radical understanding of sentimentalism. Neoliberalism today is rooted in 18th, 18th century understandings, uh, beginning with John Locke, of the importance of individual rights. But in Locke's lifetime and afterwards, it was his treatise on moral education that was most influential. And so here scholars like Helena Rosenblatt find what she calls a lost history of a liberalism that is focused on duty to society and to the common good. And finally, there is the Adam Smith problem, how to reconcile his first work, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, with his later, more famous work, uh, The Wealth of Nations. And so here, scholars focus on the importance of empathy and the community that is created through, the, um, uh, through, through commerce. But what if we focused on what Smith focuses on in the theory of moral sentiments, which is our duties to others and how to reinforce our duties to others in uh, Wealth of Nations, which is in fact a rather dark picture of capitalism. So now we come to Russia. And duty in Russia, you might think, well, that's easy. You translate it as dolg. But that turns out to be a very incomplete picture. Uh, I found four words that the Russians use. And it turns out that there is a long period of transition that we can see through translation. So initially, there's really only one word that nobles have for their duty, and that is their service duty, dolgnost. Uh, dolg is reserved for religious duty. And this is, in fact, how Karamzin uses these words. There is a separate uh, word that uh, uh, for obligation, a biazinist, and then there's a legal obligation, an abizatelstva. And so here we see Tatishchev in his 1740s lexicon uh, trying to explain this new idea of, of duty as dolk uh, to his readers. And we can see a tautology. He explains dolk in terms of service duty. And under service duty, he says, see dolk. And he also uses the terms um, abuzatelstva. Richard Wortman came out recently with a book of eight charismatic words in the 18th century. And I was interested to see that he identified, uh, uh, defined some of these words in terms of duty, but duty, which seems so ubiquitous, uh, didn't seem to him to be a special charismatic word, which my work suggests that it is. And we discussed it, we're friends, and uh, he agreed with me that he probably should have included duty. And here, to convince you how omnipresent this debate is, I have for you a terrible slide, but highlighted the words for duty. In the discussion between Bazarov and Pavel Kirsanov, uh, their first fight, verbal fight, about nihilism and being an aristocrat. And you can see Turgenev kind of explaining this through the French term, the bien public. And you see that Turgenev alternates between uh, duty and obligation. And in fact, this is how 19th century writers uh, create individual systems for themselves, either emphasizing dolg or obligation abiazinist. And so Dostoevsky prefers duty and Tolstoy prefers obligation. Uh, and uh, Khvashenskaya uh, alternates between the two, uh, but we can see that writers use it systematically. So here in Pushkin's Captain's Daughter, uh, we see that the word for duty, uh, dolg, is now firmly in place a uh, hundred years after Tatishev tried to explain it. And we see 
uh, the hero confronting a familiar conflicting duty between his service duty and his love for uh, Maria Ivanovna. But Pushkin had another problem, uh, and that is the title of the, the, no the novel, uh, What to Do with His Heroine. Uh, and so here I published an article in which I showed that he borrowed his ending for this, this novel uh, from Sophie Catan's uh, blockbuster bestseller, uh, Elisabeth Ulay's Exilé de Sibérie, which takes place in Russia, actually, and it was based on a true event. And so here, what Pushkin did was he took Elisabeth's filial duty to her father and transformed it into Maria Ivanovna's service duty, her understanding of who she is as being part of the uh, noble service culture. And we see this in an extraordinary meeting between her and the Empress Elizabeth, uh, which has its parallel in Catan's novel, where the heroine meets uh, the Emperor Alexander I at his coronation. And Catherine the Great asks Maria Ivanovna who she is. And she says, I am the daughter of Captain Mironov. And that, in fact, is who she is. And so here, Pushkin uh, solves a problem for Russians on how to uh, Russify, adapt uh, this uh, European uh, convention of filial duty for daughters uh, into an understanding of one's role in Russian service culture. As Pushkin published Captain's Daughter, he witnessed the rise of George Sand in Russia. So George Sand in Russia represented a common European and Russian language. Her special role in Russia is measurable not only quantitatively, as you see on this slide, uh, Russians translated Sand more quickly and more often than any other country in Europe. Uh, but we also can find it qualitatively. And so here I have a few quotations about the importance of George Sand. Dostoevsky wrote a scholarly study of how writers, Schiller, George Sand, influenced Russia and to what extent would be an extraordinary and serious undertaking. And in his eulogies, he wrote about the sublime moral purity of heroines who took duty to new heights. Eugenia Tour wrote that George Sand is not only a great writer, but also a thinker, not only a thinker, but also a political figure, a public intellectual. And Eugenia Tour was called the Russian George Sand. Not necessarily because she imitated Sand, but she, she was in constant dialogue with Sand and in fact argued with Sand. And in 1926, in his uh, English, written in English, Russian literary history, uh, Prince Sviatopolk Mirsky writes uh, that George Sand and Gogol were the father and mother of Russian realism. Sand's philanthropic sentimentality, a sympathetic attitude to human beings without distinction, became the formula of all the Russian novelists and was what Europe accepted as their message to mankind when they were first revealed to the West. And so part of the immense power of George Sand in Russia uh, in its stratified Russia service culture was that Sand dissolved class and gender boundaries and it dissolved the boundary between Russia and Europe. And so I'll, I'll be concluding by talking about how three writers, uh, all in different ways, uh, used Sand's novel, Horace from 1842, which engendered a very strong reaction from Russian writers, especially men. So Horace is a provincial bourgeois He's a law student in Paris, 
and he's a writer. He's a caricature an attack on Sand's lover, Alfred de Musset. Uh, but in this novel, Sand also reinvented duty and love uh, in ways that break the rules. The heroines, well, they are completely morally compromised. One is a grisette. Uh, she lives with the hero, a noble who is studying for a profession in medicine. Uh, the narrator, and the other is Marta. She's from the working class, and she lives with Horace, who gets her pregnant and then abandons her. So Horace is distinguished by being a grand talker who has very little follow through on anything that he says. And he's clearly a hypocrite. And Russian men, writers, were all disturbed by Sand's caricature of a, of a French male writer. So Alexander Herzen, the liberal, says about himself that there's something whorish-ish in me. Turgenev is similarly disturbed. And Tolstoy writes to his brother, Horace's personality resembles mine. I'll talk and no action. This is what writers feared. When Hlashinskaya, Turgenev, and Dostoevsky transform Horace into a Russian, he becomes a nobleman who is feckless and dangerous because he cannot do his duty. So Hlashinskaya in an early novel from 1854, The Test, uh, bases her hero on Horace. In her first tale, Anna Mikhailova from 1850, she had already referenced Richardson's Clarissa and A Woman's Duty. And the title of her last novel from 1886 is Obligations. And so we see that this is a consistent theme through her career. So in the test, the heroine Varenka faces the usual war of duties uh, of her love for a man she really loves, a civil servant who happens to have a hundred serfs, uh, and her obligations to her parents and to her family. Her mother, who is a truly evil character, wants her to marry the neighbor who has a thousand serfs but mother and father disagree. And so she has her father's blessing to marry the man she loves, uh, but she does not have her mother's blessing. And so this is her twist on the war of duties. And through the machinations of her evil mother and her uncle, who is the Horus figure, uh, she is forced to marry. She feels herself obligated to marry the neighbor with a thousand serfs and reject the man that she loves. And her uncle is a phrase monger and in Khvashinskaya fashion, he doesn't fail through anything, any large failing, but just in all the small kind of slippery slope types of things that go wrong in day-to-day -day life as he allows his sister to scheme with his help. In Turgenev's Rudin, uh, we find that Turgenev melds Horace to the anarchist Bakunin uh, to create a picture of a superfluous nobleman who happens to be an absentee landowner. He courts the heroine Natalia, who is uh, in somewhat of a George Sandian fashion, like the heroine Indiana from one of Sand's first novels. Uh, she allows herself to fall in love and makes this radical declamation to, Hor uh, to Rudin that she's all his. And Rudin is, is horrified by what he's done and suddenly backs off and uses her duty to her mother as, as, as an excuse, so to do the right thing. He manages to leave 
as quickly as possible and leaves behind two letters, one about love and the other about debts. And so Turgenev has a marvelous passage uh, where one of the uh, landowners uh, describes Rudin. He considered it his duty to write this letter and he presented himself to you out of a sense of duty also. For these gentlemen, there is a duty in every step and everything is duty and debts. And the play in Russian, of course, is on the fact that duty and debts are the same word, dolk and dolgi. And the heroine in the end marries the dutiful landowner. In Dostoevsky's The Insulted and the Injured, uh, we have another interesting problem. It went through five editions in his lifetime. It was his most popular novel in his lifetime, but it is a problem novel for scholars who rarely write about it because it's hard to say what it is. Uh, it's a bit of a mess. Uh, it's an early novel where he's trying to learn the craft of writing novels after having been in exile and in prison for 10 years and having to start over as a writer. And so he turns to George Sand. So his heroine, Natalia, is Dostoevsky's first Sandian her heroine. She has conflicting duties to her father and to two men. Uh, this is, uh, we see Dostoevsky working out his, uh, his triangles, which becomes one of his favorite uh, methods of, of uh, building characters. Uh, and she's in love with uh, Prince Alexei, who has competing duties himself to his father and to two women, uh, the heroine Natalia and to the woman that his father wants him to marry because she's wealthy. And finally, we come to his father, Prince uh, Pyotr Falkowski, who is one of Dostoevsky's early devils. Uh, he is a nobleman who behaves like a debauched aristocrat. He calls himself the authentic Russian soul. And in his confession to the narrator, who is a, a thinly disguised Dostoevsky, he has a very important uh, passage in his confession in which he rejects everything to do with duty and obligation. I, for instance, have long freed myself from all shackles and even obligations. I only recognize obligations when I see I have something to gain by them. Life is a commercial transaction. It's better not to pay one's neighbors, but to know how to force him to do things for nothing. I have no ideals and I don't want them. So his evil is not just in that he doesn't do his duty, but it is a complete rejection of doing one's duty. And it's an attack on the radicals. And here it's quite clear that Dostoevsky understands exactly what that conversation is in European literature. And he's using it in all different ways, very creatively. And Dostoevsky, I discovered, like other Russians, questioned this whole conversation of duty from Europe. He questioned whether duty was enough to restrain Russians long used to, to violent uh, power over others, uh, what Herzen called Preisvol. Russians questioned whether they were even entitled to a duty to self or whether they should just keep, keep on working with their onerous duties to others. So how does this picture of, of Russian novels and of sentimentalism change a novel and a canon that we know well, Anna Karenina? So I come back here to uh, Gary Saul Morrison's Timeless Questions. Sentimentalism explains why Anna is an ambiguous character. Western readers sympathize with Anna in her struggle with society. And of course, Tolstoy doesn't represent that society in an attractive light. But we debate her suicide and Tolstoy's intentions in 
having her commit suicide? Did he kill her? And so here I think that the international literary and political dimensions uh, surrounding the composition of Anna Karenina can help us uh, think through these questions. Tolstoy was influenced by his friend Nikolai Strachov, a conservative Slavophile, who was not only a friend, but also his editor, and with his wife helped publish his novels. Um, he reviewed John Stuart Mill's The Subjection of Women. And in this review, he makes some extraordinary claims that unlike English women, Russian noble women are not subjected to the power of men because they have property rights. And this turns out to be a theme from the beginning to the end of Anna Karenina in the person of Dolly Oblonsky and selling off her forests because in fact, she is the owner of the property that her adulterous husband is, is selling off to finance his lifestyle. Strachov instead claims that it is noblemen who are subjected in Russia because of their service obligations. And he writes extensively about obligations. And he argues that noblemen, because they understand what it is to be subjected, are, are not likely to subject women. They're, they're more subjected themselves. And this becomes a very important part of the uh, central conversation at the Oblonsky's dinner party at the center of the novel about women's emancipation. And one of the characters asks is, women want jobs, but do they want the kind of jobs that we want, the kind that we don't want to do, uh, the kind that we're forced to do, right? They want these service positions. And Strahov also argued that Russia had no great heroines on the scale of the greatest English heroines. And here he was thinking of Clarissa, for example. And so in Tolstoy's initial drafts, Anna resembles uh, Alexander Druzhinin's uh, Palinka Sachs, uh, who is a, a bit of a tawdry uh, adulteress. And by the end of the novel, uh, by the end of the drafts, uh, she in fact becomes a truly great heroine. And I think he took up Strachov's challenge. And so in the context of this newly uh, reconceived sentimentalism, Anna's greatness lies, among other things, in the fact that she restrains her passions for an entire year, uh, despite Vronsky's uh, very persistent entreaties. And she feels great guilt once she succumbs to Vronsky. But Irina Raifman has argued in the story Family Happiness that all that rich interior monologue that Tolstoy creates for his heroines can be used to simply condemn them from the inside out without him having to do anything. And it shows in her interior life that in her relations with her husband and especially with Vronsky, that she's very self-interested. She wants her duty to herself, to her happiness. And so her sin, I think, is that she brings down the elite service careers of two men, not that she doesn't understand the everyday intimacy of love, because that's not what these relationships are about. And so in novels by men, I discovered the noble women as heroines are rewards to noblemen for their service. And in the next chapter, the final chapter of Anna Karenina, we find Kitty marveling at the service of her husband to others. He does it all for others, for the peasants, for he manages the estates for his half brother and for his sister. And so Kitty uh, acts out this uh, marvel of uh, understanding of what a marvel of service her husband Levin is. And this is exactly what Drujinin in Polinka Sex wants Polinka Sex to do. And, and she doesn't really care about her husband's service as a bureaucrat, as a landowner. And by the end of her life, as she's on her deathbed, 
she realizes what a marvelous service noble her husband was. So some conclusions. I think the gold standard for a feminist approach is that you not only add women, but you change the entire picture. And so what my research using a lot of data has shown is that there is a century long European conversation about duty that not only men, but also women actively participate in together. And that Russians took the war of duties into new directions. And I hope I've shown that by rethinking sentimentalism, uh, that we have new ways to read the works that we thought we knew and that we can rediscover writers uh, from the past. So from Jane Austen to George Sand and in Russia from Alexander Pushkin to Nadezhda Flushenskaya. And so that's my conclusion. Thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Hilda. Thanks a should lot. I, should I stop sharing the screen so that we can all see each other? Yeah, maybe that would, okay. yeah, that's probably better. Thanks a lot for this uh, wonderful talk and uh, uh, this very detailed talk. And uh, thank you also for discussing the uh, bibliography, which uh, uh, was um, very uh, important and to uh, for our graduate students. Okay, so uh, we have almost 45 minutes left for Q&A, so we would like to start. Questions, commentaries, let's have them. I have a few questions, but I will ask them at the end, as tradition requires. Anyone? Yes, Dasha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, me. I'm actually starting the, the Q&A so that the students see that you can start, you can ask stupid questions and not, uh, you know, <laughs> be set on fire. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Hilda, for your, for your talk. Very detailed in, in, indeed. And um, it was of particular interest to me because uh, as maybe you have gathered from our a few uh, exchange for for a little exchange at the beginning. Uh, Leticia Ducou, uh, present here, and myself, uh, we have published very recently a um, um, how do you say it in English? A special uh, issue, uh, yes, of our um, um, uh, journal uh, Revue des Etudes Slaves mm -hmm. uh, on uh, Russian literary history on how to write it uh, now in 2022. Um, it is not a new <laughs> uh, Russian literary history, but it is a, um, uh, an ensemble of articles that question the methodology mm -hmm. and the various methodologies used to write Russian literary history. And uh, in particular, we had one a uh, contribution from Catherine Géry, who I believe has left, uh, unfortunately, uh, this, uh, this session, but who has uh, worked and is working now on um, women uh, writers in Russian uh, literary history, and asked the question on how to write a new uh, history of Russian literature, including women writers. Uh, of course, um, working from uh, all those uh, uh, important books uh, and works you have uh, mentioned also in your talk, uh, Barbara Held, Katriona Kelly, uh, etc., and uh, asking how one uh, should proceed. You know, uh, exactly the same question actually you asked in the beginning that uh, really uh, struck me as very important. Uh, should you write? Um, uh, against the against existing canon, or should you create, uh, I'm quoting you, a mini canon of your own, or uh, what should you do? 
And so it is, uh, it is very interesting because actually a few of the methods you have uh, quoted also, uh, quoting Franco Moretti, for, for instance, it was also um, one of our topics of questioning. Uh, and uh, this, this is why it, it is very interesting for us and it's very interesting for me. And we don't have any, uh, any uh, definite answer. Uh, besides, you know, um, um, favoring all new possible directions and all new possible reflections on the topic, uh, and maybe going toward a new form also of uh, writing a new history of Russian literature that would not be in a form of a monograph, uh, you know, of a narrative that would go from point A to point Z, or to point you get what I'm saying, uh, but that would be, um, you know, multidirectional, because it is multidirectional. So, um, so, so there. And so, uh, the stupid question I was going to ask you after thanking you for your talk is, um, uh, if I understand correctly, you suggest to look uh, at the uh, at the novels themselves, at the uh, and the writing them itself. So not only at uh, who wrote what, but uh, um, <laughs> what was written. So to read actually the novels uh, these women writers wrote, uh, instead of going the route, uh, as you have said, Barbara Helt and Katrina Kelly had taken of not necessarily reading those novels because they were not as great as uh, the other ones uh, we know about. And so if I understood cor correctly, your approach is um, partly uh, uh, a, a thematical one. So you, 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 you chose a theme, uh, the theme of beauty, and uh, I believe you, you, it, it, is, it is a great choice, actually, because indeed, if you, if you read Lotman, <laughs> you see how important it is in this culture. And so uh, how would you sum up or how would you define precisely the, the perspective you suggest to take on Russian literary history or on um, history of Russian literature, which is not exactly always the same thing, no. you know, to, to write it differently, to write it as, um, to, to write it in a way that we readers of our time understand the mo in the most accurate way how things worked back then, how things were written, how things were read. And so the, 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 yeah, the stupid question is how to do it. <laughs> how would you suggest we, we, we do it? Uh, how can we, we rewrite this history? Uh, how would we go outside of the canon uh how very 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 you know in, in very in a concrete in a material way how how would you do it so there thank you in advance yeah. Th thank you uh and i'm 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 thrilled to learn about uh this this article and this collection and uh i will read it of course Great. Uh, so <laughs> I like that you say if there's a big difference between Russian literary history and literature in Russia. And in fact, my, my book is about literature in Russia. And so what I realized with this kind of European literary empire is there is the, the problem of, of literary histories is that they are national literary histories. And so they mm. don't reflect the book market, certainly in countries that are heavily foreign. And so I think any, any literary history for Russia has to take into account translations. Um, but that seems to go so completely against the spirit of a national literary history. Um, what I did in my book was uh, I embedded a, a different way of telling this history in the in the very structure of it. And so uh, most of the chapters pair men and women. Mm -hmm. I, I originally 
you know, my dissertation is about 24 women writers. Uh, and I, as I started thinking about how to integrate them, I realized that our field, for whatever reason, it's a very small field. Uh, we're not English, we're not French literature, uh, we're not German literature. And so uh, there are very few people who work on women writers. And so if I wanted my work to be read in the field more broadly, I would have to work on all the men writers also. And that's what I set out to do. And so each chapter pairs men and women. And so the article I published out of the book is about Pushkin and Safi Katen. And I've had a lot of pushback against that article. Uh, I was excoriated in the Times Literary Review by James Meek uh, over, uh, writing about a new, tra new translation of Pushkin's prose by Pavir and Volokhonsky uh, because he argued that, uh, you know, as you look at Captain's Daughter, the very place where Pushkin imitates Katen is where he's the weakest writer. And I thought, that's not possible. I mean, he's uh, Pushkin. Uh, it seemed to me really understood what sentimentalism was. Uh, and so there is a resist, a real resistance in our field to combining the great writers with women. So what I do in every chapter, I found places where uh, the data showed that there was a very significant engagement, uh, but the research never discussed it or declined to discuss it. So Karamzin was the foremost translator in Russia of Madame de Jean Lee. Uh, but, you know, Lotman's not interested. <laughs> no, no one's interested in this because she's seen as second rate, but she wasn't. <laughs> uh, she, why did Karamzin choose the most important French writer of his day to tie his name to in every single issue of his new journal? Uh, for two years. Uh, and he was not alone in his appreciation for Jean Lee. In a chapter on uh, Zhukovsky, I pair him not with the Protasovist sisters who overshadow his, you know, his biography because he was in love uh, uh, with Maria Protasova and could never marry her, but with his other cousins, the Yushkova sisters, uh, uh, Madame Yelagina and her sister uh, Zontag, uh, and they were writers, translators, publishers, and they together had a, a, a full literary career, the three of them, uh, that is fascinating, producing all the literature that they felt the Russian market needed. Uh, I look at uh, the Empress uh, Maria Fyodorovna, uh, who oversaw the education, the curriculum for the education of noble women, uh, which produced many women writers and translators. And uh, she is attacked by, uh, by the end of the century by feminists, by women, for not producing uh, uh, women with a good education. Uh, rote memorization was criticized. But what these women all take for granted was the education in multiple languages. And that education was part of what Madame de Jean Lee, who was a renowned pedagogue, who was the, uh, was the tutor for the future King of France, the Duc d'Orléans, who in 1830 becomes King, uh, she wrote over 15 treatises and, and her treatise alone among treatises for education emphasizes the importance for language, which culturally is at the heart of, of Russian education for nobles. Uh, and this, is, this was part of that education that allowed these noble women to be these extraordinary translators. Um, and then I compare... Uh, uh, Evgenia Tour with Turgenev. Uh, they competed, they were friends, they sparred with each other, um, and with Genshirov. And, and the background there is George Sand everywhere. And then I compared Nadezhda Kvashinskaya with Dostoevsky, uh, which has never been done. Uh, but they both worked very hard to earn a living as writers. Uh, and they both admired each other. Uh, Koshinskaya with uh, more reservations than uh, Dostoevsky, who thought Koshinskaya was extraordinary. Um, 
And then the final chapter is about the Tolstoys, uh, the, uh, that, uh, that extraordinary uh, literary uh, and financial partnership uh, between husband and wife. And Tolstoy's work has now been published thanks to the work of our Canadian colleagues. Uh, and so we have uh, much more of her literary production than we had before. Uh, but that is an ongoing uh, reevaluation. Uh, I think we, we like to think of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky as the most important, most popular writers in the 19th century, but uh, they were all self-publishing and they were self-publishing thanks to their much younger wives and Dostoevsky's mm -hmm. wife. We have the letters uh, in which she explains to Tolstoy's wife how to make money and how to publish. And when Tolstoy hands everything over to his wife, including the management of his estates, he's not just kind of uh, washing his hands of them. He's handing everything over to a very good manager who he trusts. <laughs> uh, and, and she got no respect for that. And, and in fact, she was uh, uh, constantly criticized for uh, all her extraordinary work at promoting her husband. Um, and so... Uh, these are all different ways, I think, to think about what that literary history would look like. It would have to include the translations. Um, I love uh, thinking about, uh, you know, men and women in partnerships in uh, nodes. Uh, so uh, that's another way I think that it's possible to do. Uh, there is a very interesting French literary history that uh, was spearheaded by Denis Odier uh, that is chronological. That is another uh, very interesting way to do this kind of project. So I think there are there are different ways, uh, not the usual to have not the usual narrative. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes, of course, uh, the Nihol year, we, we talk about it also in our yes. issue. Um, we discuss it in our introduction. Uh, thank you very much. I think it is very productive indeed. You know, you, 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 what you describe in some of the cases, it's like uh, joining together what one would think of uh, being the center and the periphery. So yes. what is the canonical and what is the marginal and also, and so it, uh, it 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 um, it leads to you know um, uh, going over uh, going over and, and letting and letting go of uh, labels and uh, and um, and uh, and so uh, looking at these interactions again from a real perspective to quote Abraham Redblat uh, and to to you know to look at the interactions uh, I love your idea of pairing. Uh, men and, and women instead of uh, delivering uh, solely uh, uh, an anti-canonical uh, women's history, women's writing, a history of women's writing, sorry, uh, that would be opposed to the ones we know. Thank you very much. I will okay. send to you if, if you if you like, uh, I can send in the discussion the link to the issue on uh, Russian oh, literary history. Thank you. Thank you so much. Your your rep, the representative of the Etude Slav was at the ACES conference, um, but she wasn't selling books. She was only uh, uh, for public for for giving publicity. Uh, Rodolf, we don't hear you. Right, thank you. Uh, and by the way, speaking of the journal, uh, I think it would definitely be a good idea to send Hilde an issue, but uh, I think what would also be a great idea, if that's possible, Hilde, would be for uh, University of Toronto Press to send us a copy of your book when it comes out so that we can publish a review on it. Thank you. That would, I think that would be interesting, you know, yes. and it would be interesting to French readers to know about your book, so. If you can do that, if you can arrange it, that would be just great. Yes, because yeah. French literature is such an important part of the Russian story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, more questions or comments, please. Yes, Melanie. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, I have um, a bit different um, question. It's um, because I just... Uh, uh, began interesting me for um, 
old Russian literature where there was a lot of uh, women writers, mm -hmm. uh, for example, nuns and, uh, and others. And uh, as it was uh, always anonym writers, um, I think they were uh, as much uh, written as um, men. And uh, there were a particular situation in uh, ancient Rus, Rus uh, for uh, women instruction. And uh, do you think this uh, background of um, of uh, old Russia uh, could influence uh, modern literature um, and uh, how people approached? Um, women writers, as uh, they knew a lot of uh, women geographers or other women writers of the medieval. I I think this is a fascinating topic. Uh, I know nothing about it, um, so I look forward to to reading your work. Uh, <laughs> but as as scholars of of women writers kind of keep discovering new texts. I think we want to, Russia Russia is part of an international network and I think we want to keep that in mind. Uh, and uh, that that is you know, what I would be looking for uh, in medieval Russia, <laughs> the international connections, because you know, they're certainly there uh, from, from Kiev on. And so, uh, it would be very interesting to look at uh, what women write in Russia in connection with with Europe. Yes, sure. Thank you, thank you, Melania. That was a great question. More questions, more comments. Anyone? Maybe I will ask my questions then, so that and we'll uh, uh, leave you some time to think about your own. Polina, I'm sure Polina has a question. Would you like a few more minutes to uh, think it through? Okay, so uh, thank you very much again, Hilda. That was fascinating. Uh, I have a few slight comments and then a few questions. Um, my first comment is that um, uh, when you started presenting the structure of your book, uh, and your um, mythology of pairing writers, I could not not connect that with the fact that uh, one of the early collections which you presented in your PowerPoint was called the Plutarch mm -hmm. of um, Lady Writers. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering whether you could elaborate on this. Uh, how does that you know how does that make sense to use this? very old and and traditional approach uh and and to make it new the way you uh obviously did so that was one thing uh the other thing is um concerning Karamzine and Madame de Genly you said that and it's true that uh Lotman didn't have a lot of interest in that but uh of course and you know that uh a Russian colleague Olga Kafanova worked mm. a lot yeah, she worked a lot on this before she moved on to working on Georges Sand, and she has uh, quite a few uh, quite a few papers on that. So now about my questions, um, my first question is about the uh, the label the Russian Bronte sisters, and I must admit, uh, you know right on that I don't know Khvashinskaya, I don't know the Khvashinskaya uh, sisters. Don't you think that how do you um, reconcile uh, using this kind of labels with the dynamics of uh, invisibilization? How does how does comparing Russian unknown writers to you know more famous Western writers help us discover them, or on the contrary? create uh, a bias uh, which will be instrumental in uh, keeping them invisible from the point of view of the Western canon. So that's my first question. My second question is 
actually related uh, to the first one. It's also about invisibilization. Uh, it's about the title of your monograph, The Rise of the Russian Novel. And my understanding after listening to your presentation of the structure. So Karamzin and Jean Lys, that's chapter one, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the, the chronological boundaries uh, of your um, investigation uh, are the the, uh, the the late 19th or early uh, the, the eight the sorry the late 18th or early 19th century until the end of the 19th century right mm -hmm. okay uh do you did you discuss um in your book earlier Russian novels like the novels by Fyodor Emin for instance which yeah, I like yeah, yeah, much yeah, 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 yeah. And and if not, uh, how the, wh what could you say uh, about you know the the traditional use of this uh, title, the rise of the Russian novel or the rise of the novel? You know, you mentioned Ian Watt, and then uh, I thought about David Gasparetti, and yeah. uh, it's interesting to see that each time a new book comes out with the rise of the novel in the title, it's sort of, and of course that's the old agenda, it redefines the canon, but um, it probably also keeps something invisible from the new canon that it's redefining. So that would be my, my, second, my second question. And my third question is about this whole concept of literary empire of European literary empire. How does this concept of empire, which is very inclusive and includes Russia, how does that help us uh, think about this in terms of center and periphery? Because, uh, you know, judging by uh, the, the amount of translations that um, existed on the Russian novel market, my first um, sort of uh, intuitive reaction would be to call that market uh, a colony, not so not well a part of the empire, but you know the colonized part of the empire. So, how does the uh, the whole framing of this system as an empire, and uh, and maybe not a colonizing empire on the one hand and a colonized literary market on, on the other. How does that help us understand the dynamics between dominating imperialist cultures and, and you know, sort of dominated, dominated uh, cultures? And how does that compare to the U.S., for instance? That would be, that would be a, a, something that I would be interested in, in hearing from you. Thank you very much. No, thank you, Rodolphe. You're giving me a run for my money and I really appreciate it. So first I want to, my I chose my title very carefully and I've put it in the chat. It is not the rise of the Russian novel. It is the rise of Russian novels. Uh, okay, and, and fair that, enough. That is, that is very, very important. Yep. Um, so I'm glad that you pointed that out. Um, it's it's meant to sound like <laughs> the rise of the novel, which is the usual title, but it's it's meant to be really quite different um, for all the reasons that you list. Um, so so thank you for pointing that out. So I'll just uh, start with your your comments and then go to your questions in the order that you asked them. Uh, so the Plutarch of Lady Writers. Uh, this is simply a I. Uh, a, a use of a genre that was ubiquitous. Uh, so Plutarch is being reprinted in all kinds of editions. Plutarch for children. Uh, so Plutarch for ladies um, and for, for women writers. Uh, I also discovered in my research, my translation of Catherine the Great's memoirs that she uses Plutarch as the structure for her last memoir of the, of the four that she wrote. Uh, it is a comparison of her and her husband, Peter III, and that is the, the standard under the basic standard understanding of what, what that Plutarch is. It's the comparison, it's the parallel lives. 
Um, but that's not how all of these other kind of popularized versions of Plutarch work. Um, uh, so it's it's simply adding women to a men's genre, but you know, keeping all the women separate. So it, it works very much on the same principle as the earlier compilations. Hilda, um, my, I'm sorry, Hilda, my understanding is that in Plutarch, he compares uh, great men from Rome with great yes. men from Greece. Yeah. So there is kind of a domination of a symbolic domination relation. Uh, because the Greeks stand as models to the Romans. So how how do we escape that in a new narrative about, you know, male and female couples? Just so there, yeah, so well, Al Alcibiades, for example, is not a <laughs> is not a model yeah. in many ways. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, these these are compilations that aren't using the comparison. Mm -hmm. There, there is no, there is, that's not, that's, they're right. simply, they're simply biograph, you know, collections of biographies. Okay. And so it's, it's, you know, they're using a, a it's more, it's a marketing term. Right. <laughs> uh, in that way. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, on, on uh, Karamzin and Jean Li, of course, the, Bibliographic information I have on their relationship is from Olga Kafanova, and the bibliographic information I have on on uh, George Sand is also from Olga Kafanova. And so she has written an article or two, but it, it's really not kind of on the scale that the that the topic suggests. Right. Um, and so you know, I I do use her work. She really compares two tales, and I, I use that um, in part, but um, my focus was much more on the aspect of duty, uh, which is a topic that I, I found is vastly understudied. <laughs> um, so, it, you know, Clarissa, uh, Richardson's Clarissa is the epitome of duty, and uh, there is really one study of this, a very important study by Thomas Kamor, um, and uh, but that that is what I found. I haven't found a study of George Sand and duty. Dostoevsky understood that that was what George Sand was about. Evgenia Tour understood it. Readers all understood it, but uh, it's just not how we approach this literature. So it just offers you know vast new avenues for uh, uh, showing how all of these works are interconnected men and women, women and women, men and men. Um, the label of the Bronte sisters, that is a marketing decision uh, in many ways. Uh, and so uh, there are there are other questions. Uh, we talk about George Eliot, but that was her nom de plume, as was George Sand. Uh, but we are referring to the Hwashinskaya sisters by their actual names. Uh, it would, George, Nadezhda had over a dozen pseudonyms uh, divided by the different genres that she practiced. And, you know, I have an essay that will be forthcoming in one of these collections about all those pseudonyms. And there are marketing decisions according to those pseudonyms also. And so, uh, I don't, I, I don't think uh, that calling them the Russian Bronte sisters is, is, is going to in, invisibilize them. Uh, it's meant to give them visibility. I don't think anyone expects Russians to be like English women. Uh, and it's really, as I've discovered uh, in, in my work, that uh, this is this is this is how the marketing of this this part of our literary studies works. If I could connect them to Jane Austen, I would. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, just as you know, Kathy Nipomishi tried to connect Pushkin to Jane Austen. Uh, it's it's a very powerful marketing tool. Um, and what that tells us is that readers of English literature expect to read women writers. Um, and our students are happy to read women writers. Um, it's just the field is somehow resistant. Um, and so we have a publishing problem um, as well as a scholarly problem. 
Uh, and uh, the last question about the, the European literary empire and uh, its inclusiveness and the question of center and periphery uh, and what you really see is a uh, Russia as a literary colony um, of Europe. That's a fascinating question. Um, and I can only offer a few comments. Uh, I've been reading Pushkin this semester with my students. And so uh, the colonization and the colonizer mentality uh, and Edward Said's Orientalism are, are obviously part of, part of those discussions today, especially. Um, and, you know, Said makes very clear in his study that he's talking mostly about Britain and France, and that countries like Russia occupy a kind of liminal position. Uh, they are both colonized and colonizers. Um, and so, uh, you know, Pushkin has a liminal position in, in these kinds of discussions also. Um, or not so liminal as I, I, I kind of discovered. <laughs> um, so this is, uh, this is a, a fascinating question. Um, and I think what, you know, what I saw, it, what my research really made clear to me that, uh, I, I, I think I'm the first to take the European market and use that to understand what's going on in the Russian market, uh, we wouldn't necessarily understand that the various editions of Sophie Katan are part of a much larger market if we didn't have that understanding of that European market. Um, and so I think it, it serves to reveal a great deal. But uh, there are, you know, Melissa Frazier has a fascinating discussion of uh, uh, the library for reading and Sankowski uh, and the whole question of the center and the periphery. Uh, so this is, I think there's, there's a, a, a large, this is an area for further scholarship. Um, and I think you raise a fascinating question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There is, um, I was thinking about this because, uh, you know, the way um, these Russian writers keep ranting about the fact that no one reads their novels because yeah. readers, Russian readers are too busy reading, you know, foreign novels in translation. Uh, that's pretty much, you know, sort of a situation of colonized people so i think that's interesting and uh there's a very good book i don't know if uh you have heard of it uh it's a french book by a scholar called rahul markovitz and it's about the french theater in europe uh in uh well it's 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 in the uh the second the the second part of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century and he really uh, discusses theater as um, uh, cultural imperialism, as French cultural imperialism. So French, yes. French plays being, being played throughout Europe everywhere. So I do have some data for you on the complaints of writers that they're not being read because readers are primarily women readers. They like to blame for reading literature in French. Uh, that's the elite argument the Russians like to make, what everybody everybody is doing, in fact, is reading literature in translation. And right. in fact, any literary, any study of literacy, the first fact you learn is that men are more likely to be literate than women. And so the complaint should be directed at men and not at women. Um, but there is a study of reprints. Uh, all right, I, I think I did it or somebody else did it. Um, of reprints of novels. And so it turns out that Russian novels at the turn of the century, so the uh, era of uh, Emin and others, Russian novels are reprinted in larger quantities yeah. than European novels. And maybe you're familiar with these statistics. Um, and so this is, uh, of course, important. It shows it shows us that Russians want to read Russian novels. Um, uh, and, but the writers are, are feel differently, obviously, from their perspective. Uh, but in fact, their feelings are not borne out by the the data. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Thank you. I think Martin has a question. Martin Maisel. Yes. Yeah. Hello, Hilda. Hello, Martin. Thank you for coming. Oh, my, delightful. Um, I, I wonder, Hilda, if you get to the uh, the explicit attack on the concept of duty at the end of the century, uh, after uh, it has been co-opted into uh, conservative attitudes and such, uh, coming from Nietzsche and uh, Ibsen and and the socialist Bernard Shaw. Uh, and his accounts of Wagner and and uh, uh, and uh, Nietzsche and and so on, um, as um, uh, as inimical uh, to uh, to uh, to society itself. Uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, for those of you in this uh, group who may not know Martin Maisel, he is a distinguished scholar of George Bernard Shaw. Uh, and so uh, this is a running conversation between uh, Martin and myself, and I'm very grateful for this question. Uh, so yes, on, on the European side, the debate about duty is marvelously, uh, is, is marvelously satirized uh, by, by Shaw and by others. Uh, but on the Russian side, we have the, you know, the attacks on duty not only by Dostoevsky, who upholds it himself, but shows those attacks. And we have the attacks by the nihilists and by the radicals, uh, because their position is that there is no conflict between what you understand your self-interest to be and what you understand your duty to be to others. Um, and this, of course, undercut the position of the nobility as as sacrificing themselves on the altar of duty to others. Uh, and so that was, that was the debate in Russia. The debate in Russia disappears entirely with the end of the Soviet, uh, with the end of the Russian empire and uh, in the Soviet period. Uh, and it's marvelously shown in the place you would least expect to find it, uh, Zamyatin's uh, science fiction novel, We. Uh, where he uses the whole uh, discussion of duty as a way to show his engineer D-503 kind of coming to life as a human being uh, as he becomes a writer. Uh, he discovers his conflicting duties, uh, where, and he's uh, completely uh, uh, confused by this because he only recognizes that one duty to the state. Um, and so this is uh, Zamyatin's cr critique, but the word duty disappears entirely in the in the Soviet period. So I think that uh, what we have we have a Russian trajectory here, <laughs> uh, but and we have a European trajectory. How exactly the Russians understood that uh, conversation about duty in Europe is another question, and I don't have any I don't have any plays play, ways to get a toehold on that. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, coup de grace was administered by Hemingway after the war. Okay. Which is a, yeah. <clears throat> after the disillusionments of the First World War. Right. Mm -hmm. So it all ha seems to happen at the same time in different ways. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Hope. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Any more questions, comments? It's Paulina? actually, yep, sorry. Paulina? Paulina, did you come up with a question? Well, I'm, I'm actually in a public place. Uh, okay. Do you hear me? So I just try to be very, very quiet. Um, well, yes, one, one little comment is about dog. Uh, yes. because the connection was very, very bad. So I probably missed uh, some parts of your your talk. Uh, but Dolk also has an, 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 um, um, a sense of uh, credit in a sense, in financial, financial sense. So you, you, ты можешь иметь долг in the, it's денежный долг. So mm -hmm. it's also connect, connected to the um, idea of uh, credit, of доверие. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, if, if, if for the one for the, for the Russian ear, it's also this. This is also important. Ah, I owe you. So, 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 Mm -hmm. And uh, another question I had is about this empire of uh, empire and colony. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think for for Russian Empire as a as a place as geographical place as a cultural field? Um, where was the most important center? Because I think it was like few centers, and they like moved around. Uh, because your your um, your study is quite wide from the late 18th century until the until the 19th uh, until the beginning of 20th century. So probably you can say when and where this um, uh, this capital, like cultural capital, for Russia uh, uh, was placed. So I knew perfectly well that it was it was for for a long time it was Paris, but before and after and. Uh, well, this is a question. Mm -hmm. This is my question. And also, thank you very much for your for your study because uh, um, so I, I it's very useful for my work also. Yes, mm. and, and I was very I was just so happy to hear you present on your work in the uh, NYU nineteen V series. So um, thank you for that again. Alina, um, maybe you could be the one reviewing the book for the Revue des Etudes Slaves. <laughs> Sorry. You. <laughs> thank you. Um, so yes, yeah, so you, you this is uh, you raise a very important uh, question about the kind of the Russian imaginary cultural capital of Paris. Um, one one thing I try to do in my book is to uh, uh, foreground Germany. Uh, because Germany was right there. Uh, it's, it's what we think about less. Uh, and uh, of course, there were, there were cultural centers that were simply, you know, by geographical proximity occupied a certain uh, important place. Um, and uh, so this is, this is another way, but I, I think, you know, for, for Russia, we already have the I like I like Lutman's idea that their uh, Russian culture creates places and uh, creates uh, cultural places, uh, placeholders. Uh, so under Peter the Great, you know, the other important language was Dutch. Uh, I'm Dutch. Uh, I I appreciate that. But then other languages could fill in in that slot. Uh, and so Russia is unique in having two cultural capitals. And so I, I like your idea that uh, Russia can have multiple cultural capitals. Um, and uh, I think, you know, it's hard to generalize. It's a very large, diverse empire. As I always tell my students, Russians are a majority minority in their empire. And that is where all the energy and the anxiety about Russianness comes from in so many ways. And the it's the energy of the of the literature that we are reading. Uh, and so uh, I it's it's hard to generalize, I think. Um, and so I, I like your idea that uh, the, that that idea of cultural capital is fluid. And we're talking about the OL capital and not the AL capital or how the OL and the AL come together. Okay, it might be interesting to uh, take a look at how does that uh, translate into um, the translation market. Uh, was that a thing that some Petersburg or uh, publishing houses or on the contrary, Moscow publishing houses would would specialize in? Or I don't know, maybe even some provincial publishing houses. Any any data on that? Any idea about that? So I the slices of the market that I have, so 1800 to 1805, uh, 1825, 
uh, the various catalogs, uh, they include the provincial markets. Um, mm. So uh, that includes Vladimir, um, Ariol, uh, uh, Tver. Um, so these are provincial markets that are, in fact, on the periphery of the of the major markets. Would would they specialize in publishing translations? Uh, because... Oh yeah, Katsuboy, they would be published in multiple multiple places. Yes, but I mean, um, uh, was publishing translations cheaper than publishing original writers, for instance? No. That well, is that is a reissue, I... reissuing already published translations. Was that cheaper? Was that more? um accessible affordable for i don't know provincial publishing houses those are all publication questions that people like abram reitblatt and others will have to you know sort out for us because um <laughs> we need we need lots of archival information for that true that's true okay thank you all right um i thank think you everyone we might be done Thank you very much, Hilda, for um, coming to our seminar and giving such a splendid talk. Uh, we'll be happy to have you again anytime. And uh, let's just keep in touch. Then. I agree. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. It was. Thank you. So happy Thanksgiving to, you know, the ones who are about to celebrate it. And, and uh, I'll see you in uh, two weeks, hopefully, for the last uh, session of our seminar. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Merci.